Please be opening your Bibles once again to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 18. This we have read at the beginning of our sermons preached concerning the word of reconciliation. We want to continue to do that because it gives great emphasis to the fact that no man can be reconciled to God except through the word of the gospel that is preached to us, that is set out in the scriptures. Verse 19. Well, we're beginning with verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. I remind you that the ambassadors of Christ are the apostles of Christ. We refer to them as ambassadors because... They had a special assignment and work to do. And that on the day of Pentecost, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, giving them the supernatural power to do the work the Lord had called them to do. It is through them, by the Holy Spirit, from Christ, that we received the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. I may pause here and add this. I think in the last sermon that I quoted James 1.25 and cited James 1.27. Now, if you don't know what those verses are, look them up, read them, think about them, and they'll do you good. So, we have the complete, perfect law of liberty from Christ via the Holy Spirit's work in the apostles, thus the early church, as is said in Acts 2.42, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. <coughs> we today must continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, which is another way of saying the word of reconciliation. And during that sermon last time together, because you'll know we paused last week and discussed what the Bible said about the value or the worth of a soul, because it seemed good to go in to that in view of the fact that the word of reconciliation is designed to save souls. But back on that time, two weeks ago, we were looking at the ambassadors of Christ, the apostles of Christ, and we were noticing the extraordinary, I say the extraordinary work of those ambassadors or apostles of Christ. By extraordinary, that of course indicates there's an ordinary, but the extraordinary actually is the miracles that the Holy Spirit enabled these men to do. You find that the converting power was not in the miracles that they did, but it was in the truth of the word that they taught. With Christ, the miracles were simply to help prove, or part of proving, that he was the Son of God. The purpose of the miracles with the apostles was to show that they were the ambassadors of Christ and thus, as an ambassador of one government to somebody else, they could officially state the position of Jesus Christ regarding salvation and godly living. And this they did. As we continue with that idea, we notice another reason that the miracles were done to show further the purpose of them and that is that miracles were necessary in bringing about the very existence of the natural universe but they were not necessary in the perpetuation of it. a miracle brought the earth on which we live into existence i say a miracle would be to us we were there to see it because it was the 
supernatural power of God by His Word that caused things to come into existence. The writer of Hebrews tells us that even now that the Lord Christ upholds all things, that would be all natural law, which He spoke into existence, by the Word of His power. So gravity works today because God wants it to work. And so all natural law. So a miracle brought the earth on which we live into existence. Placed it in its particular position. But it is kept where it is, doing what it does, by what we call natural law. Itself being created by God to do what it does naturally. Now, the different species of animals were brought into existence by a miracle. But each species is perpetuated by natural law, the law of procreation, we might say reproduction. The same is true of all manner of vegetable life. It's required, that is, it required a miracle to create the first oak tree. But all other oak trees have been perpetuated until this present time by natural law. And what is that natural law that seeds will produce after their kind? And those seeds are the germ of life, which man, even to this day with his great med uh, medical and scientific advancements, cannot understand and does not understand. So it is true of the religious systems. The day the church started in Acts chapter 2, first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, it all started by a miracle from the Holy Spirit. But the church continues through the word of reconciliation, the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8 verse 11. And like the seed of the oak tree, we can say that it has within it, that is the word of reconciliation, what we might call a germinal principle by which the church, the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, the family of God has been perpetuated ever since and there are no Christians. The word of reconciliation has not been preached or the seed of the kingdom has not been sown or taught to the minds of men. After filling their place, that is miracles, in the infant stage, or we might call it the childhood stage of the Lord's church, then those miracles cease to be needed. For when the whole New Testament was revealed and confirmed by miracle signs and wonders to be from God, no more need for it. They had done what they came to do. Paul discusses that when he's correcting the Corinthians due to their abuse and misuse of those miracles. For you see, they had no completed written down New Testament in those times. And there Paul says, love or charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, that's miraculous knowledge, folks, it shall vanish away. A lot of us sometimes wish it hadn't. But no, if we learn and get knowledge today, we have to go through the normal human processes of study. But then Paul went ahead to say, for at that time, the time he was writing, for you see he was writing part of the New Testament, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which was a supernatural action. He said, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but... When I became a man, I put away childish things. Miracles belong to the childish part of Christianity, the infant stage of the church. That was the time when if you're going to know the will of God, you had to have the miraculous gifts to do so. Those miraculous gifts were in the early church. By the laying on of the apostles' hands. 1 Corinthians 9 lists 12 of them. The apostles had all of them, plus one, the imposition of hands to put any of those gifts in the church by laying those hands on members of the church. Again, I say, Paul yearned for the day when those things would cease and he'd have a completed New Testament in his hand. Paul never had a completed New Testament in his hand. 
Nobody else in the first century did. But it was revealed and it was confirmed to be from God, not from men, the will of Christ. And the early church understood that, Acts 2.42, by the miracle signs and wonders they did. Today we have the completed New Testament. James recognized that when he said, And whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, he being not forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And that's our obligation, and that's what we're trying to do for that perfect law of liberty is the word of reconciliation. With those things settled in our minds, I would like for us then to emphasize the converting power, the converting power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now the power to reveal and confirm the word as I said earlier and said two weeks ago, was in the extraordinary manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But I emphasize again, His power to convert us to Christ is found only in the words that the Holy Spirit through inspired men preached and wrote. And this is evident from all the cases of conversion under the ministry of the ambassadors of the court of heaven, the apostles as recorded, by Luke, himself inspired of the Spirit in the historical section of the New Testament, which is the book of Acts. This fact sometimes, we might say, crops up incidentally. And a case in point is found in Acts chapter 5. A council composed of the high priest and his kindred, being of the sect of the Sadducees, who didn't believe in spirits or in miracles and angels, had commanded the apostles not to preach any more in the name of Jesus or by the authority of Jesus because they were preaching the resurrection of the dead and that didn't suit them, Acts 4, 17 and 18. And to this charge, Peter and John, apostles of Christ, two ambassadors, had said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard, verses 19 and 20. And incidentally, that emphasizes the definition of what a witness is. You have to see and hear something. You have to experience it with your five senses in the physical body before you can be a witness. Obeying God rather than man, the apostles continued to preach and do signs and wonders to confirm the word they preached to be from God and not from men. And they did it by the authority or in the name of Jesus Christ. The results of all of this was that the whole city was stirred to its very depths. Wouldn't that be wonderful if that happened today? Fear came upon the church and multitudes of men and women were added to the Lord through their belief and obedience to the gospel. The fame of their work spread to surrounding cities and multitudes from those cities came into Jerusalem simply to hear the word of God. Now the high priest and all that were with him, understanding, seeing that they had been thwarted in their efforts to stop the spread of this new religion, to say the least, became indignant. And they laid their hands, as it were, they arrested the apostles. And they put them in the common prison. Acts 5 verse 18. But as one fellow has said, and I quote, man's extremity is God's opportunity. From a human standpoint, now think about this, strictly from a human standpoint, the apostles were powerless. But not so from the divine standpoint. Does this remind you of Paul saying, my strength is made perfect in weakness? This time, we actually have an angelic being from heaven as the divine messenger. We learn that these angelic beings do God's commandments. They hearken unto the voice of God's word, Psalm 103, 20. Multitudes of unsaved people at that time are in the temple there in Jerusalem. 
What all the angels know about the salvation of man, we don't know. But they are servants of God, and they flawlessly keep His commandments. And you can be sure, since they played a part in man's salvation, they were concerned about salvation of man. And this angel desired the salvation of these people. He understood to some extent what was necessary, at least the extent of carrying out God's will for the reason God sent him there in the first place. Now, instead of going to the people, he went to the prison and he opened the doors and brought the apostles out. And here's what he said. Go and stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. There's our words of reconciliation again, Acts 5.20. The words of this life are the words that give all spiritual life here and life eternal thereafter. And they are the words that the apostles of Christ have been preaching from Pentecost, Acts 2, and that had resulted in the sal salvation of thousands. Well, why preach all the words of this life? I want you to think about that. All, not some or most, but all the words of this life. Why do that? Listen, because a partial gospel will not save anybody. Man shall not live by bread alone, our Lord taught in his earthly ministry. And this is what he said. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4 and verse 4. Every word in this Bible is for man's good, spiritually and designed to lead him from heaven or from earth to heaven. Now, let me ask you, which part of the Bible would you leave out? Well, none of it. All Scripture, some of it, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That means spiritually complete. Truly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Incidentally, this history teaches that the saving power, again I emphasize, because so many emphasize to the contrary and that erroneously, is not in the extraordinary, but it is in what is ordinary to the church. Now what is ordinary to the Lord's church? The study, the belief, and obedience of the Word of God. Now, that's what's ordinary to the church. You remove that and there is no church. The words preached by the apostles of Christ. Of course, as you know, from your study of the Bible, if you are a Bible student, this is sustained by all manner of other passages in Holy Writ. James, in writing to the, as he says, the twelve tribes scattered abroad, said, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted American Standard says the um, well as it says here the engrafted word the implanted word by the American Standard which is able what's it able to do what can it do save your soul James 1 21 Paul in the synagogue at Antioch speaking to the Jews said men and brethren Children of the stock of Abraham, whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Acts 13, 26. Then Paul, in writing to the church in Ephesus there in Asia, said, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Ephesians 1, 13. And then Paul to the brethren in imperial Rome had this to say, as I quoted earlier, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans 1.16. But writing to the church in the city of Corinth, in Achaia, in Greece, Paul penned, moreover brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, 
which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. All those terms say the same thing. The word of reconciliation must be preached and men must believe it and obey it in order to be forgiven of sins, which is the way one is reconciled to God. Now, if you go back to Acts 2, and we did earlier, but if you look at a very careful analysis of that chapter, where we find the apostles of Christ, the ambassadors of Christ, first made known the terms, the terms of reconciliation. You'll find all that you need in detail. On that day the church began to help you understand how it is that this gospel of Christ, this glad tidings of Christ, Saves one from sin. And it will remove the misconception existence to this present day that it takes the supernatural working directly independent of the Word of God on the heart of man, the sinner's heart, in order to save him. In the entire record, I say the entire record, the complete record, there's not a single solitary statement that would lead one to even surmise that any were turned to the Lord by some kind of silent influence of wonder-working power from the Holy Spirit. But, to the contrary, there is so much to show that the word spoken and heard brought about the great result, the forgiveness of sins through men that believed and obeyed it. In verse 4, it is said the apostles, after it is said they were filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now the Spirit gave them something. Gave them tongues. That is languages. Well, a language has words in it. Words are signs of ideas, or vehicles of thought. And thus, the thoughts of God were put into the thoughts of man by the words that were preached, which words came from Christ by the Holy Spirit, infallibly guiding the apostles on the birthday of the church to proclaim the gospel. Verse 6 says, When the multitude came together, they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Well, he spoke words. And words conveyed the message. Verses 7 and 8 say they were all amazed and marveled, saying, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue? Verse 11 says, We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Verse 14 says, Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, listen, and hearken to my words. Verse 22. All these miracles being done all around them. And he says, listen to our words. God made man a rational creature. We're spending time on Wednesday night on emphasizing the inward man or the heart of man, the spirit. Well, part of the heart of man, one component part that makes you what you are is the fact you're an intellectual and rational creature. All of our computers are really patterned after the way man works. And too much of them are like most men are, garbage in and garbage out. But with us, we're to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Intellectually, we contemplate it, we think about it, we understand it, we draw conclusions. And with the will God gave us, we act upon it or reject it. Verse 22 says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Verses 36 through 38 say, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the scripture says, because those people understood those words, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. The idea of heard there means they understood the message. The words brought the thoughts of God to them about themselves, and about the way of salvation. The way of reconciliation is in the word of reconciliation. And they were pricked in their heart. Their conscience hurt them. And they said to Peter 
and to the rest of the apostles. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verses 40 and 41 say, And with many other, not miracles, not extraordinary events, but with many other words did he testify and exhort. Words that testified and exhorted. The meaning of those words gave forth the evidence and exhorted them, urged them to act upon the truth that was preached, saying, save yourselves from this untoward, this crooked generation. There was something for them to believe and something for them to do. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Well, they couldn't do what Jesus did. He lived a sinless life, tempted in every point like as we are. Thus, He's the sacrifice for sin on the cross of Calvary. They couldn't do that, but they could hear the word that proclaimed Christ and Him crucified. They could hear the terms of pardon set out in that word that would allow them to appropriate the blessings of what Christ did for them on the cross and dying for them and shedding His blood for the remission of their sins. The blood of the Testament. You know what that means when He says the blood of the New Testament? It's the blood of the word of reconciliation. It makes it efficacious. It makes it powerful. And thus then they gladly received His Word. They that gladly received His Word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now there's a simple plan of salvation. Why confuse it? Why compromise it? Why only preach part of it? The totality of the plan of salvation is to hear the Word of God and from those words understand how to be reconciled to God. To understand God's part in our salvation that we can never do for ourselves and understand our part and believe in understanding how belief is formed. And then there are terms of pardon that in that, sal that gospel we understand how to be saved. We understand the terms of pardon that we must meet. And one of them is through the word we're brought to faith, confidence, trust, belief in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that leads us to obey Him. For he's commanded all men then everywhere to repent, Acts 17.30. And following that repentance, they're to confess their faith in the Christ, Romans 10.10. 10. Now and then only is one qualified before God to be immersed in water by the authority of Jesus Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of one's sins. And there, in a short space, about 13 times, it is said in some way, words were spoken and words were heard. In the midst of all that extraordinary work of the apostles of Christ, there was the word of reconciliation that those miracles had confirmed to be from God and not from man. The apostles spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance and it was in this way that the Holy Spirit led so many into the kingdom of God that day. For the Holy Spirit was revealing them the words of Jesus Christ, who is the Savior, He who purchased the church with His blood. Notwithstanding the extraordinary manifestations of the Holy Spirit on this occasion, those who were charged with having crucified Jesus with, Peter said, wicked hands, were by now divine power in the gospel preached and heard and understood, turned, as the Bible says, from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. All through the words of reconciliation, understood, believed, and applied, and the terms of pardon met, and people being baptized for the remission of sins, and added to the church Jesus purchased with His blood by the Lord Himself. Therein to serve Him faithfully, a study of that same word in learning how to be Christians, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else, just members of the blood bought body of Christ. I think it evident that in every case of conversion that you'll read of in your Bible, or we might say every case of reconciliation, under the ministry of Christ's great ambassadors, the apostles of Christ, the saving power was in the gospel they preached. 
and not in the attendant miraculous manifestations, nor the silent so-called movings directly of the Holy Spirit on the hearts of lost men. Conversion is not, as I said a couple of weeks ago, a convulsion. Conversion involves the heart of man. It involves a rational understanding of words given to us on our level to understand. And the application of the truth in those words to our lives. And when we do so, we are made Christians. God forgives us of our sins. He holds them against us no more. He blots them out. And the Lord Himself adds us to His spiritual body, which is the church. All of this has to do with the simple, great proclamation defense of the gospel. <clears throat> Let us put our confidence in that and act accordingly and defend it and sound it to the four corners of the world without apology and without compromise. If you're not a child of God this morning, we've studied how to become one, and you know the importance of the word of reconciliation. Child of God, if you sin, there is a second law of pardon for the child of God to repent of your sins, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. Now, are you subject to the invitation of Christ to become a Christian or to be restored to your first love? As God searches your heart. Please rise up in all love of the word of reconciliation and submit to it to the glory of God and the salvation of your soul. And do so now while we stand and sing.